Hi everyone and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 103rd New Social Environment. I'm Malvika and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between Devandra Bonhart and Connie Llewellyn. Uh, we're very, very thrilled. Um, so we're really looking forward to this conversation. Uh, we're also, we have a special treat to have the poet Murat Nemet Nijat here today with us who will be reading uh, a few of his poems to close today's program. So looking forward to that. Um, we'd also like to quickly thank Dermot Company for supporting this week of the new social environment. You can learn more about our curatorial projects with them in the links in the chat, which I will drop shortly. And now to introduce today's host, Connie Llewellyn. Thank you, Malvika. And before I introduce Devendra, let me just thank everybody at the rail who is making this and other talks possible. I'm just amazed at how much you accomplish in this very strange world we're living in. It's helping us a lot. So thank you, Malvika, Fong, Catherine, Nick, Lewis. I know I'm forgetting people, but it's really been a pleasure working with you. Um, now, Devendra. Devendra was um, born in Houston but grew up in Venezuela with his mother. He moved to California as a teenager and enrolled in the San Francisco Art Institute in 1998 um, and dropped out in 2000 to pursue his musical career. His first album was released in 2002 with Charles C. Leary and has continued to produce many albums, I think almost a dozen at this point, along with um, many singles. Um, also pursuing at the same time his writing and his visual art. His visual art is presented in The Vanishing Wave. We'll look at this a little later. And I left my noodle on Raman Street, both of which we'll see images at, from. And uh, his first volume of poetry was published recently called Weeping Gang Void Yab Yum. So let's start, Devendra, with your background, which is unusual. Um, you grew up in Venezuela. What was that like? <laughs> in a word. <laughs> was it in Caracas? It's, it's, kind, it's really the Caribbean. And you know, it's, it's the northernmost tip of South America. And, and so it's really kind of in the Caribbean. And when you're there, and I had this sense my entire life, nature will win the battle <laughs> that these insignificant little ant people named humans are trying to wage against her. And it was so obvious because you could hear like jungle is like young forest. It's like this like teenage forest and it's just slowly eating every human structure. And so I had this feeling like, oh, this is the thing that's going to eat me. This is, is this thing that's going to eat me and it's, and it's the jungle. It's a, but it's a beautiful thing to be eaten by you know, if something's going to eat you. Um, and it feels that way to this day. And you can smell a lot of the, the gasoline is all, the smell of gasoline is like kind of perpetually in the air. And there's also the smell of fruit. This, these are my early memories and my memories to this day. But before I go on, I also want to say thank you to the Brooklyn Rail for having having me. And thanks, Connie. Connie's my friend. And this is like, I'm kind of just doing this so I can get to see Connie and catch up. <laughs> So it's nice to see you, Connie. Thanks for okay. having me do this. I'm here. <laughs> so have you been back to Venezuela any time recently? I mean, things are so terrible there now. Things are so bad and they've been bad for so long that I realized a couple of days ago, uh, really sad, really sad to realize that, uh, that in the last year, the world has kind of become aware of the kind of kidnapping of an entire country by a dictator. So Chavez was the person who tried to overthrow the government in 1992, I think, and then 
he went to jail. And then in 1998, he became the, the president. And then he passed away and he gave his, um, he gave the power over this guy, Maduro. And he's, Chavez was terrible and Maduro is even worse. And really uh, like everyone has been affected by it to this point where none of the basic needs for any type of existence are available to like almost everyone in the entire country. And it's news and it's a new thing for the world to see, oh my gosh, Venezuela, it's like, this is a disaster. People are really, really starving. They really don't have electricity. They don't have running water. There's no economic anything. People, you just pay with like, you just have a scale and you just pay by the weight of the amount of money that you have. And when I went back about two years ago, I, I, I thought, wow, like the version that we even read about isn't some sensational crazy Fox News version. It's actually the Disney version. The reality is even worse. Yeah. And then on top of that, I realized that we're just used to it. Everyone's used to it. My family's there and I go, what is going on? And what's it going on today? Oh, it's just the same thing it's been. So that's this like horrible, it's a crazy thought. Like they're, they're just used to how bad it is. And the world is kind of just getting a glimpse of how bad it is. But people in Venezuela are, are, are kind of used to it. It's like decades of extreme, extreme corruption and violence. It's really kind of terrible that people do get used to those things, you know. Uh, well, I guess it's the way it is. But um, anyway, you you uh, did move to California, I think, as a teenager. Yeah. And what? And you enrolled in the Art Institute, San Francisco Art Institute, that is. Yes. Um, so what what drew you to that? I mean, what? How did that decision get made? Um, where did you go to school? Oh, I grew up in the East Coast. I went to um, a high school called Ethical Culture. Ethical <laughs> Culture? Yes, it's another story. It's a great school. Some of you in New York will know it. Um, and then I went to Mount Holyoke College, which was one of the seven sister schools in Massachusetts. Yeah, then I came out here and I got my master's degree at, um, at UC San Diego. And uh, here I am. Why UC San Diego? Well, it, we don't want to go into it. <laughs> at the time I was living there. San Diego is a real mystery to me. Yeah, I, it's another conversation. You know, <laughs> I, I don't know they're all I, that. I've always wanted to know. I'm curious because it's like a really boring place. It is. I was really happy to leave San Diego. Anyway, moving right along. <laughs> you were at the Art Institute and you studied both poetry and painting, correct? Yeah, yeah. I went actually in uh, the try. I, I guess I, I. I think my my college experience began the day I dropped out. Okay. So I went for interdisciplinary arts, and I was doing printmaking, sculpture, performance, sound, drawing, painting, and poetry. And I was mostly attracted to poetry, painting. And, and, and the sound class, because there's no music class, right? So in sound, I don't even remember my teachers, and I, I, I don't remember my teachers, any of my teachers names, because one of them was so important to me, it kind of overshadowed all my teachers. The only teacher I've actually ever really, that's been my, I cared about, which is Bill Bergson. I was my poetry teacher. And the day that I realized that I just have to look like an art student and I don't have to pay. Wow. I mean, I realized kind of art school for me was just the people I was going to meet, their ideas, their energy. As long as I wear a particular artsy outfit, then no one's going to ask me, what are you doing here? And then I have access because my, my card, my, my, my ID card, I don't know. No one really looked, scrutinized it. So I could still go to the library. <laughs> so I kept going to the Art Institute for like a year after I dropped out. And I feel like that was the year where I was really utilizing art school. Because Bill was, was my friend by that point. Bill Bergson, the poetry teacher, at this point was my friend. And so I felt very comfortable asking him about poetry. And he's happy to talk about poetry. 
So it, I didn't. Yeah. Okay. Now that now that I'm kind of will willingly coming here, I can take advantage. It's almost like if somebody gives you, um, like if somebody gives you a blank CD and goes, "Here's my work," you know. But if they really give you something very beautiful and they really package it beautifully and they write a letter there and they and they put put a lot of they they present it in a beautiful way, you're really going to pay attention to it and listen to it. So that's kind of what it was like when I dropped out and then I realized, oh, I can actually, I should just go here, not because I'm I'm forced or obliged to, or, or I'm gonna go in debt if I don't. Um, so school began the day I dropped out. And you know, the Art Institute is back. Excuse me, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Well, no, no, not at all. The, the Art Institute is back. It had, it had, it had. Well, we're, we're, we're praying. We're praying that it's back. And in fact, there's going to be, the Brooklyn Rail is going to be sponsoring a webinar uh, in a couple of weeks, which is going to talk about not only the Art Institute, but the plight of schools like the Art Institute now, which is pretty dire. But yes, it's looking pretty good for the Art Institute, thank goodness. I was uh, really, really bummed out about that. Yeah, we were all that feeling that. But it was interesting because when we started to talk about today and what and how it was going to you structured, I said to you something like, well, Devendra, you're primarily a musician. And you said, no, that's not true. <laughs> so in other words, what I get from that is that your art making and your writing are equally important, or you don't really, you know, you move from one to the other rather seamlessly, it seems to me. They've, there's just been a, a parallel practice since the Art Institute. So I was going, I'd go to painting class with with uh, Carlos Villa who was also really important and really I really loved and then poetry with Bill um, and then kind of dipping into those other disciplines but then going home and just working on music so that was a the, all those were parallel disciplines and and today I kind of divide the year between working on an album and touring it and then either painting or drawing so I don't know I guess I don't really feel like I'm a musician but I let's, make music, yeah. Let's look at the first image. Kath, is it Catherine or Emily who's controlling the imagery? Hello, hello? Emily? There you go. Um, can we do it where we have full screen? Yeah. So, no, go back. Okay. What we're seeing are just uh, two album covers as, a, as something to look at when we're talking about your music. Um, your music is hard to define. I have heard all kinds of ways of defining it. Everything from freak folk to new weird America to psychedelic folk. I don't think any of this really matters or I don't know how, if you <laughs> care. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but you have lots of, lots of people you cite, lots of musicians you cite as influencing everybody from Kurt Cobain to Vashti Bunyan to Arthur Russell to Catano Veloso, we talked about how much we love him. Could be Lou Reed, Anthony, so a whole variety of people. And so you do move from one style or mode to another. But you know, I found this when I was doing my research for today, I found online something I really don't think I'd ever read, which was um, an interview that Johnny Ray Houston did with you and Bill, in fact. Um, and you talked a lot about your music. So let me just read a short quote. You said, every good record has to have a series of place and a, ser a sense of place rather, and a sense of time. It would be such a travesty to get rid of all the little elements and say, let's get rid of the buzz a bee came in, a dog bark, let's get rid of that. Those parts would make a record unique. You remember saying that? <laughs> <laughs> Do you still believe that? <laughs> I mean, I guess what you were saying is that, you know, these small accidents that might occur, you know, they're just part of the process. Yeah, yeah. I mean, or maybe I just hadn't really figured out how to record in a way that you, <laughs> avoid can, that. <laughs> you can avoid the dog, the fucking dog barking, ruining the song. So you've just got to embrace it. Oh, yeah. No, I just love that dog barking at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I, 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 this cover is so nice to see because it has a, there's Cliff Hengst is there. 
and Cliff is an old friend from San Francisco and a wonderful artist. The guy with and, the hat on, right? Yeah, the guy with the hat off. That's Clint, Cliff Hanks, a wonderful, wonderful, just yeah, all, yeah. also really, I think, interdisciplinary artist. And his partner, Scott Hewicker, is an incredible painter. Yeah. And, and, and a lot of these people, I don't know, because the vinyl version, we just said, send in a photo and we'll put it on there. Who's that? Who's that? I don't know these people, but some of these I do. And then the black and white photo in the, I guess from our view in the left side, in the middle left, the black and white photo is that's a Noni. Um, and that there she is like, I don't know when, but quite some time ago and kind of this goth, uh, new romantic kind of phase. Um, and I must have not really liked the the this person who I was who I signed this for because I don't ever sign anything like that. I did it probably in this really quick way, so I don't even know where you got that. Did where did you get this image? I guess I got it off the internet. I had sometimes people ask you to sign something, and it you get something very genuine. Like, will you sign this for me? Okay, of course. And then sometimes it feels like I'm just gonna put this on eBay. Okay. And this is very rare. It isn't like people are always asking to sign things, but just now and then, and the energy is very like, Hey, whoever you are, just sign this so I can try to sell it on eBay, that energy. And I think this person must have had that because I'm just, you could see it. The I sign it like this. The It's kind of embarrassing. <laughs> so sorry about that. Sort of inspired by Sgt. Pepper, I guess, the album cover. They were extremely inspired by, by this record. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, in that very same interview, you said, um, I've got tomatoes here, cucumbers here, all the ingredients. Some songwriters approach music like that. Others say, I'm going to invent this vegetable called berbagul. I'm very aware that I'm using ingredients. I always think of that interview with Dylan, where they ask, are you a poet or a songwriter? And he says, I'm a song and dance man. I wish the quote had been, I've got some tomatoes here. And just stop there. <laughs> you, you also say my favorite art when I go to a classical museum is the devotional art for just that word, devotion. You know, I don't know if you tuned in to when we did a, um, an interview with Nick Dorsky recently, who's a filmmaker and who's written a wonderful book called Devotional Cinema. And it's mm. just interesting that that came up just before we, you use that term yourself, devotion. Um, let's go to the next image, Emily. Okay, so I thought we could talk a little bit about this book, which uh, obviously is called Vanishing Wave. Um, tell me a little bit about the, how this book evolved. Let's look at a couple of the interior images, yeah. The book contains these beautiful black and white, I guess, ink works on paper, which are very much seem inspired by, you know, Japanese sumi, sumi painting. And it was in response to that horrible earthquake and tsunami of 2011, which destroyed so much of the coastline in Japan and also upward of, I think, 19,000 people. So Devendra, you were in Japan not long after that, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I was there maybe a, a, a week after it had occurred, after the tsunami that had really, really kind of devastated um, Fukushima. And we played a little benefit just to pay, to raise money to pay for people from Tokyo to, to, to take a bus, take buses out there to help out, right? Just kind of to get some feet on the ground because the devastation was so widespread uh, that they just needed hands to kind of lift debris and and hopefully find people i mean it's really really uh oh, it's horrible horrible and so we we had just arrived it had just occurred we played a little benefit to just get people out there and then years later years later I read an article about a family that was still looking for their daughter, their yeah. young daughter. I mean, they're still looking for, her. you know, it's years, years later. So that's, that's how much, you know, how sustained these efforts to, um, 
to kind of relieve some of the suffering uh, require. They just take it takes years. It takes years for these things to. to Let's look at some of the other images, Emily. Uh, yeah. So, anyways, this this show was done where uh, to to kind to just raise funds for all the many charities that are still going on. You know, so many people lose so much, and it's like there's this immediate push to help out when something happens right at the moment. For example, you know, Beirut. It was a couple of days ago, and, and now we've got a lot of people donating, and that's wonderful. But yeah. that damage is going to take years and years and years to repair. So this was kind of a show where years later we came in, had a show in Tokyo, a show in Kyoto. All the pieces were sold, just went to three different charities. One of them was Ryuichi Sakamoto's charity, and so we were very fortunate. We got to kind of uh, you know, use use that to get him to to have, have put a little quote in the book, which is a, was a huge honor for me because I really think, you know, Richie Sakamoto is really one of the greatest kind of artists ever. I think I really do. Do we have another image, maybe? Yeah. So these are these ink wash drawings, and right. uh, the house was covered in 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 just crumpled paint. It tastes like a it takes it's a really wasteful uh, i'm a really wasteful person it's <laughs> awful but i i just it takes like a hundred sheets of paper to get one of these things right you know so it's kind of like a very animalistic approach i think to try to get to a balanced place as opposed to just really focusing and spending a long time staring at the page Although, of course, as an artist, you're kind of always staring at the page in your, in your mind. But then when it comes down to it, <laughs> instead of just really honoring this one page and then just really applying all my intention and focus in this one page, I just kind of spread out 100 pages and just go nuts with, with them. And then, ho and then hopefully one's going to work. I do the same thing with photography. You take, you know, just this. I don't even look through the lens, right? You just take photos, photos. It's just, it's very, it's, it's so dumb. It's so expensive. It's film. It's so expensive. Maybe get one picture out of a whole roll. Anyways, that's how the, the approach to a lot of this this ink drawing. By the end, the house was just covered in sumi ink and um, paper that that had to get thrown away because they just didn't make the cut. What kind of paper did you use? A lot of it is old classroom paper. So that's kind of before the before the, we, we were, you know, before we found ourselves in the new world, <laughs> in this post pandemic world, or, or, yeah, I guess this is already post except we're still in it. Um, I, uh, uh, one of the one I could know a, a weekly activity is to go to thrift stores and look through um, the furniture. I don't know why, but there's always paper and furniture. You mean you open a drawer and then you find paper? Well, paper or, or a desk or something. And so I, I always find a lot of oh, that's paper. <laughs> I never thought of it. <laughs> um, well, you yeah, also let's pay for it, but I'm just saying you can find a lot of old paper going through furniture at thrift stores. That's good to know. Let's look at the next image, maybe. Okay, this is another book, another very recent book, which is called I Left My Noodle on Ramen Street. And you can tell us how that title came about in a minute. But this book is quite different because it's, um, it's, it's many different things. It's paintings, photographs, it's text, it's mixed media. And there are several texts involved, one by Jeffrey Deitch, others by Adam Green, a long interview or conversation, I guess you had with him, who's a friend. Yes. And um, yeah, so let's look at the next. So what I did was I just took a few shots of the interior. You can go through them to show, to get a feel for the variety of what you see in the interior. One more, I think maybe. Yeah. So um, you want to talk a little bit about this book? Sure. Um, it's a book that I made with Presto. 
it's kind of like making an album. It, it, it was like a year of, of compiling work that, that, that was chronological. And it starts off with kind of the end of the Art Institute up to, I think, a, a sh beginning to use oil painting. And through it, it has these different markers and people that were very influential. For example, there's a poem by Bill Berkson in there that I really love. And the title, it w we wanted something that felt like, um, like, you know, something <laughs> that you could see on Broadway, sparkling in the lights, you <laughs> know. Um, and I'm trying to think, I, I think Morton Feldman has a book called like, Give My Regards to Main Street. I, 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 I should have looked, I hadn't thought about this, but something like that. So we wanted something that felt like that. You know, something that felt like maybe Humphrey Bogart would say it at the end of the movie. And at the time I lived on Ramen Street. This is a street yeah. in, in Manhattan. That was just, it's all, it's like 10 ramen shops. Is this in Brooklyn or is it in Manhattan? Lower East Side? It's in the, in the, in the East Village. It's oh, like yeah. on, on 10th or 8th or 9th. <laughs> it's like 10th and 2nd or something around there. I, I you know, it's, there's, <laughs> is a row of ramen and I lived above one of them. And so my house was infused with pork bone. It was like a film. It's like a film on the walls. And you know, you can't control the temperature. You just have that pole going through your apartment that's just regulating the heat. So you're boiling in the winter with this thick mist <laughs> of pork that just, and, and, envelope envelops you envelopes you envelop envelopes you <laughs> anyways that's uh, so I was, that was really on my mind nowadays i don't think about pork bone so much as i think about insects they're just constantly on my mind i think about insects constantly and i and i could see nick has this beautiful kind of rousseau-esque backdrop and i'm just so i this is why i want to get virtual reality technology just so i can be a bug on a leaf can you imagine just this huge just looking out and uh, you just see this green horizon that's still that's the leaf you're on i mean just this endless leaf wow so i just think about insects all all day long now <laughs> Okay. Uh, but back then it was a lot of pork bone. I don't eat pork, but it was just everywhere in this apartment. Anyways, I made the, I did this book. Something else more important is this. Connie was the first person that invited Francesco Clemente to show in the United States. It's true. And I, <laughs> I want to hear some juicy details about that. Because it's like, that's just like mythology to me. I mean, that's wild. And you told me he, he, he was in India or something at the time? He, he can't, you know, he used to spend part of, maybe he does now, I don't know. He used to spend part of every year in India. And he, um, he actually used materials from India to make his, his work at the time, which was uh, on paper, on this beautiful talking about paper. And um, the way it happened is I was running a program called Matrix, which was a series of, of small contemporary shows. And I was a brand new curator. And um, I uh, and I had very little money for this program. And so I had to kind of piggyback onto what was what was happening in the area. And I, I found out that Crown Point Press, publisher of Etchings, had invited Francesco to come and do some work. And I said, oh, great, because now he's going to be coming out. I don't have to pay for his transportation. I invited him to do whatever he wanted to do. And he came directly from India with a big satchel of works on paper that that was the show, you know, so there was no shipping involved. And what was, he was so charming. And, and uh, but as I was telling Devendra the other day, he only spoke Italian and, or he didn't speak English, I should say. And I didn't speak Italian, but that didn't stop him. And he just kept talking to me. And I, I mean, I was getting the gist and it was just a wonderful experience. And, and the works that were in that show, um, they were really a, a series. Later, they got broken up. But later on, the museum also hosted his first big retrospective. So I got to revisit that and other works as well. So it was just a wonderful experience. But we don't want to talk too much about that. Let's... Oh. 
Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move along. Um, what's the next image? Okay. So, speaking of poetry, this is a book of poetry um, that is also recently published, and it's called Weeping Gang, Bliss, Void, Yab, Yum. And what we're looking at on the screen is both the front and the back. Um, mm. So, talk about, I just was curious about how you view your poetry and your song lyrics. I mean, how do you differentiate? Are they somehow very related? Could one be a song lyric and also a poem. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, it seems that the poems are are the words that don't need support. So the music supports the words and and that becomes a song. And then sometimes these were the words, I guess, the certain words, right? The, they don't need that musical support or that platform because they have their own music, right? They, don't, they have their own thing going. They have their own rhythm. You can hear you know, the whole thing. That's why I've never really read the poems. I can't even read. I don't even read them out loud. They don't, they don't, make, they don't make sense that way. They just kind of exist as something you can read their own, you know. So it becomes very clear as you're going through notebooks. You have a you have you go on a writing on a writing kind of trip and you just write and then you come back and then you determine what has music and what needs music. So the poems don't need it. And maybe you know Maybe it's one of the only ways that I felt visible, you know, as a kid was poetry because in Venezuela, you know, you're, you're not really visible uh, if, if you don't and I'm sure it's the way, the way it is everywhere, but especially as a, as a young person, if you don't really, you know, kind of fit in, right? If you don't totally kind of meet a certain criteria that a very, I think, repressed society uh, tries to fit, you know, human beings into, it doesn't make any sense, but that's how it works, right? And so I was very feminine and into into drawing or whatever, I, you know, I could care less about sports. And therefore, I was just invisible in that sense. You know, it was almost like they saw very little value in, in me as a person only because I was, you know, I wasn't a certain way. And so this is kind of how I felt. And then suddenly you encounter poetry and you go, oh, wow. Like, this is how I can interact with the world. And, 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 and who cares <laughs> about what anybody else thinks? Like, I have a way to go out and, and kind of create my own world and, and I have a way to, 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 to become visible, even though I'm invisible, but I'm observing in a way that it is empowering because I go out there and I go, okay, what can I see? What can I see? You know? So it was like making yourself visible in a way, just as, a, as an individual. So that was kind of this magical kind of superpower, or at least just tool to navigate through existence that poetry kind of introduced to, in my life as, as, as maybe as a teenager, right? Uh, and of course, that's born from people like Diane De Prima and Gregory Corso, Kenneth Patchen. I go, whoa, what's going on here? This is amazing. You read Coney Island for the mind. You go, holy shit. And then you just carry it around, carry it around. Oh, okay, I'm good. I've got this protection too, my little book of poems. And just city lights, the way those books look, it's just like so beautiful, right? You go, oh my gosh, it's so beautiful. I get it, you know, wow. <laughs> So poetry is very important. And then of course I met Bill Berkson and Bill was friends with all these people. Bill was friends with my heroes. 
Bill's ta talking to me about, you know, Frank O'Hara, his good friend. And what are you, what, this is nuts. His good friend, Philip Gustin, this is insane. And, and, and he turned me on to somebody who I think is very important and very important right now, which is Joe Brainard. Oh yeah. He wrote a book called I Remember. Yeah. And, and, and it's around, you know, I think maybe like eight years ago, it kind of got people started to really get into it and you, I'd see it around bookstores. But this is the time of I remember, because yeah. it's if it's not the time of I because it's also okay it's also the time of I don't know. Well, you know when is this lockdown going to end? I don't know. Well, you know, um, I remember this little book has now been translated in something like ten languages, and what's so amazing to me is that it's really a book specifically about Joe growing up in Tulsa at the time in the fifties and what he remembered, simple things. And yet somehow it has such resonance that it's embraced by people of, of an enormous variety of cultures and traditions. I did a big show of Joe Brainerd's work years ago. Um, wonderful artist who some of you may know he's, he's um, has died unfortunately some years ago. But anyway, it was one of the shows that um, I got the most response from just, just verbally, you know, I mean, like people would come up to me, mostly artists and say, God, that show, I never knew about Joe Brainerd. It meant so much to me. So um, luckily his reputation has grown over the years. I think people now are pretty familiar with his work. Um, let's look at this next. I just want to talk a little bit about this image and the next one. There all, this is an interior image from the book, and I think there's another one too. So you refer to these Devendra as uh, Sphinx, I think. Um, it's sort of a variation on a, on a pattern that um, you called it a kind of meta work. So what, is, what does this mean to you, this image, or what does it refer to? Uh, well, I, I, I think you're referring to a, a, a different image, but I will, just to go on the record, I definitely would never call something a meta work, just to clarify. <laughs> okay, I got that from somewhere, but obviously not you. Okay, go ahead. It's ironic, the irony is that I wouldn't call something a meta work because I think it sounds pretentious, but saying that I wouldn't call something a meta work because it sounds pretentious is in itself pretentious. So there's like <laughs> this something there. This is kind of like dra drama, right? It's like, oh, it's a book of poems. So they, they, what kind of image you want to put in there? I, I think drama would be kind of funny, you know? because poetry has this baggage of being like, oh, poetry, right? But of course, the best poetry, I think, is very, very light. Uh, that being said, Japanese death poems, whoa, does it get heavier than that? You know, here's the last poem you write, which is a tradition in Japan. There's a very famous book, Japanese, it's called Japanese Death Poems. I'm sure you've seen it around. But yet, there's a lightness to even those poems. So I thought the joke would be, okay, it's a book of poems, let's do this drama. So these images are kind of my version of like, laugh, or kind of like the laugh now cry later, which is related to drama, that image of the two faces smiling, crying, right? So that kind of got maybe appropriated by, by um, uh, I don't know what, I just like some other thing. But anyways, this is the idea it was like, oh, here's drama. Uh, but the sphinxes are actually something else, but we can also say these are sphinxes, sure. But yeah. They're oh, these aren't, like these the aren't sphinxes, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry, that was that was a that was a that was my mistake. That was an, the anecdotal tangent on my part to say that no, no, these aren't sphinxes. <laughs> okay, I think we have a couple of um, other images. Here's one more, and and then we have a couple of. I can't even read these because it's so small. But um, the vendor, do you want to read this, or you don't have to? Oh, good. I won't. But I will say that. Just to really quickly mention what I was trying to say about Joe Brainard and I remember that this is very much the time of I remember. It's it's a time really like have you noticed that perhaps someone in your family or close circle of friends is is really working on their book or or maybe working on memoirs or organizing the past in a way or keeping a, a diary for the first time, or trying to write one thing every day for the first time. You know, this is, I, I'm, I feel that. I feel like people are doing that.
And, and so this is really that time of I remember, I remember, because it's a way of combating this tr supreme global uncertainty, which is totally new. You know, we're used to uncertainty in our, in our lives, but at least everything's certain out there. And it's just not the case. It's like, wow, this is like, you, it's just, just unreal. It's just unreal. And then I, and then, and then, and that feeling, that bewildered, whoa, is something that we're all experiencing. We're all sharing. So it's just really incredible. Anyway, so it is the time of I remember, and it's the time of I don't know. And those two can kind of dance together. Um, do you, I mean, is it, is poetry still important in terms of, do you read poetry? Who are the poets you read? You mentioned Frank O'Hara and some of the people who have passed, but maybe more yeah. contemporary. Yeah, well, you know, that's kind of also the paradox of this time. It's like, let's get to work. Let's get to work. And and and, po and I've got to write poetry and I've got to read poetry. And at the same time, why am I doing anything but just freaking out? That <laughs> There's a helicopter circling above me and a siren going off every three seconds. And it's like, this is wild. We're in a global war zone pandemic freak out. So it's this very amazing paradox to be in. But yeah, poetry is a big part. I, I'm, I, I'm really into Mary Oliver. And I, I have a Mary Oliver shirt that's like my pajamas. Uh, the, I really have two, I have three pajama, four pajama shirts. All right. So, it's, so it's, you kind of got to switch it around, right? Of course. I've got Mary Oliver and I sleep in my Mary Oliver shirt. It's very soft at this point. It's very comforting. And I've got a Marsha P. Johnson shirt. I oh. sleep in that. And I've got a Chagyang Trungpa shirt that a, that a, an Argentinian artist named Sofia Tormenta made. And I sleep in my Chagyang Trungpa shirt. And, uh, and a Bernie Glassman shirt. And I sleep in these shirts. Anyways, Mary Oliver is really big. And I read, read Mary Oliver every day. I just got actually devotions. It's, an, it's a compilation of her work. Oh, yeah. Speaking of devotion, you know, talk about devotion. Yeah. I, I go through devotions and just kind of read one a day. Um, and actually, I just got maybe yes, no, two days ago, this book called A Dark Dream Box of Another Kind, the poems of Alfred Starr Hamilton. Yeah. And there's not a lot of information about him. And I think he was just somebody who was submitting like 65, 85 poems a, a, a week to, to, to different, you know, um, journals, poetry journals, and and once in a while something get published, and then and then I think he he was in a in a home and passed away, and then the poems got compiled and just got released, and and just the first poem, I read it and I was that was it, I was in. I mean, it was like this is it. It's very short, so I'll read it. So this is from a dark dream box of another kind, which is a line from one of his poems by Alfred Starr Hamilton. So this poem is called Swan in June. The moon is a swan in June. The moon can paddle and paddle and be the moon all night long. That's beautiful. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. I'm really into, into starting off this book. Thank you for introducing me to that book because I, I didn't know about it. Sure. Let's, do we have another? Yeah. So we're going to move along because we're not. This is another poem that's in the book, and some they're they're mostly short. They're not always this short, but they're whimsical, lyrical, autobiographical. Um, he's got a the book and poem just to clarify. But anyways, moving on. Um, I have here just a few images of, of, of artworks that are um, show various dots, moving ahead the other way, yeah. Um, can we move through a couple of these images? Yeah. So you get a sort of a sense of the variety. Um, some of them are very, you know, surreal and show influence of like maybe Picasso here. Some are very light and beautiful and, and, and remind me of the very influenced by my work. Excuse me? He was very influenced by my work. Yeah. <laughs> yes, of course. And um, um, we may have another one. 
this I think is an album cover of a recent, very recent album, and I love this painting. And and you told me it's your sort of four way foray into oil painting, right? Hmm. Yes. And. Uh, well, that's the um, the EP that just came out called Vast Ovoid. Right. Uh, and that Vast Ovoid is kind of based on a creation myth that the world is this, the universe is an egg and the cracked open in the sun is the yolk of the egg. And there's this kind of that image was so, I thought that was an interesting image. That's Vast Ovoid. But it's funny that uh, also in Spanish, if you call someone a huevon, it's kind of like egghead. But it's an insult, kind of. It's a loving insult, you know, huevon. You know, yeah, you, you. It's like a, I don't know, you schmuck or something like that. You know, something there's something sweet and endearing about that, but it's also kind, you know, kind of a diss. You know, so that's what a huevon is. You know, uh, <laughs> but the image is these oil paintings that have started, and it's kind of going between these. I wanted to start with the most basic thing, a still life. So flowers. Let's just start with flowers, and so painting flowers, and at the same time painting these disembodied beings, you know, just body parts, just body parts. So an arm and a leg and a nose and a, and a, and a, a, a vagina or a penis floating around. And I thought that was, a, 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 it makes a lot of sense. And that feels like a wonderful thing to be painting these body parts kind of emerging out of something abstract. And it's, relates a little bit to a Vajrayana Buddhist practice called Chod, where you chop, where you visualize yourself chopping up your whole body. You chop off your nose, your ears, your lips, you, you pop, pluck out your eyes, and you put it all in an offering, in your skull actually, as a bowl, you put it in an offering and you offer it as a way of, of uh, transcending your own ego, as a way of, of, of dissolving um, your little, let's say your little you in, <laughs> in connecting with the big, the right, the bubble or the wave versus the ocean kind of thing, right? So this is a practice. I'm kind of giving a weird version of it, but Chod is that kind of offering up of one's, you know, uh, carnal self or material self or, or gross self and so these paintings are kind of related to that 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 practice and you have um, another another book that um is no longer available um it's, it was a limited edition i think we can look at the cover of that um called unburdened by meeting which is a mm -hmm. which is a collaboration between you and adam tully and um it was published, as I said, as a limited edition, and it's sold out. I guess it's a sort of a deluxe version. I think there's an interior image of Ashley Works, not by you, but by Adam Tully. Next slide. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, this is Adam's work. Adam Tully is one of my favorite um, artists. And so we just realized that we love to just work together without having to, like the, the concept of alone together is so nice and it certainly relates to right now but it, but it's like let's go hang out we're friends but let's be productive while we're doing it it's just it, to me it seems so boring to like let's just meet up and just talk i mean that sounds lovely but the idea that you are both working in the same space and continuing the conversation on the page you know it's kind of like as in, you know musicians do that too right? it's kind of oh, we're going to play music together so that's what was where this concept was born from. Um, did I send you this, Connie? Uh, I guess you did. I must have. Oh. <laughs> I guess so. I don't, I don't have it because I don't have a copy. Maybe I have one copy. Yeah. You sent you sent me a bunch of images, and then I just called others from wherever I could. You know. Mm. So um, I think that uh, we have one more or two more. Yeah, and the only reason I have this here, Devendra, it's actually your tour schedule from fall 2019, and it just gives you uh, people a sense of, of of your touring life, which is extensive and must be kind of grueling, I would imagine. But now you're not touring, you're mm. not able to tour. Mm. Um, so what are you doing? What are you doing to pass the time? Oof. 
I'm it's well um yeah this is the first time I haven't been kind of touring and playing music live for like maybe like 20 years and so this is new and strange even though I always find myself going geez I wish I didn't have to play music so this is kind of nice. uh but I'm playing uh, these new we're you know adapting to to how to play a show during this period and so that way that the way people were doing it is you play uh, a show like this, like we're right like this. So I'm right now organizing four shows that uh, I'll be playing in the order of all the songs that I've written. Um, so the first show is the first two or three records. The next show is the next uh, four or five records and the next show and each one maybe having one guest and obviously very limited, just one person filming which will be actually Moses Berkson, who's Bill Berkson's son. And mm. then one person doing sound, my friend Samer, and then, and that's it. Uh, so I guess I'm still playing music live just in this new kind of, in this new way, in this new environment we find ourselves in, which is really wild because has anyone, does anyone feel that we're halfway there doesn't it feel like, oh, okay, we're halfway through this thing. But it's like, I'm making, I'm just making that up. <laughs> yeah. And, and, there, and no, nothing, there's no indication actually in the news that, that there's, this is like, we're halfway there. This but may I be just, it, you know, I hate to think, I keep thinking, is this my life now? <laughs> I mean, that, that's probably a healthy peripheral thought. Yeah. It might... <laughs> I don't know, but you know, I, I want to, um, just before um, we conclude, I wanted to just mention something I think that is really important, um, which is about your spiritual practice, which I think lies at the heart of everything we've been talking about. And I listened to a wonderful conversation between you and Krista Tibbet on her podcast on being, which I'm recommending to everybody. And you talked about the importance of this book by um, uh, Pima Chodron, is a Buddhist teacher, Tibetan Buddhist teacher. And it's called When Things Fall Apart. And the premise is that things come together and fall apart over and over. We think the point is to pass the test or overcome the problem, but the truth is that things don't really get solved. They come together, they fall apart. Then they come together again and fall apart. And to think we can finally get it all together is unrealistic. So um, you said, for me, practicing Buddhism is like preparing for pandemic, the daily bearing witness to the suffering of the world. And you sit with it and learn to sit with it. I think that's just a nice way to sort of sum up what we're living through now. Um, we're all trying our best. But to keep in mind that to try to overcome the feeling of helplessness and hopelessness is probably not the best way to go. Um, before we actually conclude, we're gonna play uh, a, a clip, a, a track rather from um, an album, fairly recent album that was the cover of it. Um, and it's, it's called, um, I'm getting a little confused now. What's the name of this? Honey, can I come in? Is yes. that okay? Um, I hope that's okay. So uh, before we conclude at the end of today's program, we'll be, uh, we have the extra special treat of hearing a track from the album Ma, which came out um, September 2019. The song is called Kantori Angaku. Um, but if it's all right with everyone, um, well, I should say thank you so much to both of you. Thank you, Devandra. Thank you, Connie, for your generosity and um, your tenderness today in this conversation. I feel like we should be asking all of our guests and all of our hosts about their sleeping garments and whose faces are on there. <laughs> um, this has been really like lovely and intimate and just, just like really nice. Um, in the interest of time, if it's all right with everyone, we're going to transition now to our esteemed poet, Mr. Murat Nemet Mijat. Um, then what will happen, we have sort of a special schedule today. 
We'll all return to say goodbye and shout out our hellos and our salutations to everyone. Um, and then to close, we'll come together and listen to the track that we just mentioned um, together. And that'll be the lineup. Does that sound fine with everyone? Yeah. OK, great. Dope. Uh, waiting for this moment. I'm very excited. To amazing. Um, so at The Rail, we have a tradition of ending lunch with a poem. And we've been lucky enough to carry that lunchtime practice from our office into our community events. Um, so today, I'm thrilled to welcome the poet, Murat Nemet Najat, as I mentioned to our proverbial stage. Um, before that happens, I'm going to tell you a little bit about him. Uh, Murat Nemet Najat is a poet, translator, and essayist, among many other things. He was born in Istanbul and studied literature in a variety of places um, in Istanbul, then at Amherst, and then at Columbia. His books of translations, essays, poems, and collaborative works are many and profound. Uh, but they include his translations of Ayan's Blind Cat Black and Orthodoxies, and another work called Possibilities of Istanbul, which I'm very excited about. His work includes the poems The Spiritual Life of Replicants, Animals of Dan, and the essays Question of Accent. He is presenting writing, or he's presently writing the poem Camels and Weasels, from which he will read to us today and also preparing a book of English translations of the Turkish poet Sami Bedar. Uh, Mr. Nemet Nejat, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for inviting me. And also, Devendra, it's a great pleasure to share an event with you and hear you talk about your work and about yourself. And uh, today I'm going to read a sequence from the poem I've been working on. Usually every poem I write takes me about five years to finish. And this last one is uh, Camels and Weasels. So basically without further ado, and uh, I will start reading just a number of them. The interiority of an accident in the car, which has suddenly started to slide, two lovers, one at the wheel, other in the passenger seat. Now, though the car has just locked to the road, if he had found the time, he would still have turned to his lover next to him and grabbed her slide that lasts a long time, first hitting into another car, then a hole, another car, all things moving slowly till this, this moment, suddenly speeding up, bam, bam, then another bam, suddenly it stops. Like the state of humankind when a locomotive stops, an elixir moment when the ears don't hear the noise around, then slowly, slowly the world rejoins its old, raw, deceptive, dispersed details. Knowledge again softens. Hurrying steps, quotidian activities, things of rescue. But for one thing which doesn't grow soft, the car careening from one side to the other, the hand which the one in the passenger seat had placed around her lover's neck to protect her from the collision happening, the hand from that metaphysical swoon, the only thing left behind, the hand on the road to disappearance and perdition, reminding me of the only gruesome surviving residue of love. The fall of a sparrow. I'm water, a tiny pool. A bird passing by and me saying, a bird is passing by. Water, water bed, pebble, they always quarrel is the white 
uproar they make, the rests an expanding drop, standing still. Who is tapping on the window in this late hour? A lost cloud, a leaf, they are the window. Protective coloration always have green thought in a green sight. A death haiku. Haiku, haiku, hai, hai, ku, aiku, ai, ku, ku, oh, aiku, haiku, quoth the raven, nevermore. Motion, the demolishing of music as sound shifts space into music. Mike's Murder, that's a film. Chromatic vibrations enter my pool in the backyard. I loved the sweetheart of a face chase her shadow to the house. At the beginning, the slowest music, which got slower and brighter, dip. Quarrel among house objects. Ceiling does not recognize the house, thinks it is a house. Sky is the ceiling of the house. Ceiling is a dream hangout of the house. A pain to God, this is the translation from the Turkish poet of Hamburg. It is a caption from Hamlet. You muddy metal rascal. Can we call mud and that's it? Is having a name nothing? Is that all we need to know? Everything has some untouchability, but mud has none of it. Everything can step on it, feet, horses, feet, dogs, plants shoot through it. It creates shapes stepped on, covers children's and warriors' faces. Rain eases its motion, rejuvenates it, mud. We wipe it off, mud. Look, look at mud with open, gentle eyes. You'll like it. Hey, passers-by, tolerate it, don't hurt it. Mud is what mud is. I'm going to skip one or two poems for, uh, for time scale. A soliloquy on Shakespeare's soliloquy. In sleep, consciousness continues. So not quite death. But Hamlet says exactly the opposite. Death is fearsome because consciousness may not die. Consciousness continues, becomes a dream. In consciousness of suicide, death becomes a suspended act, to be or not. Dreams are consciousnesses of sleep. A sparrow is a two-legged tripod I'm the third. A blue plus blue. A trillion plus one is smaller than a trillion plus two in the infinite between two eyes. At every step, half of what is left, blue plus blue isn't two blues, but, but, one blue sky, its indifferent eyes, 
looking in all directions, whereas, whereas infinity exists before a thing happens, then a thing bear, a word here, word and obdurate orphan, Oh, orphans, orphans, the world is full of orphans, dispersed longings, things, 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 as the Prince of Denmark, my fellow orphan, reads from his book. What are you reading, my lord? Oh, stupid orphan, why, why do you listen to words that do not happen or trying to undo what's already happened, trying to join the silence of infinite zeros. Oh, my hero and, and your cruel kindness, spinning backwards, which in the indifferent eye of the sky is everywhere towards the garden. Thank you. So much, um, Mr. Mehmet Najat. Uh, this was beautiful, and I really appreciate we get to see your process and sort of seeing what you're working on currently. That's very special. Um, before we listen to Kantori Ongaku from the album Ma, we have a few moments here to bid Devander goodbye and Connie goodbye and shout out all our hellos for everyone and to do the usual like cacophony and chit chat that traditionally happens at the end of the Zoom. Um, so you should have the option to unmute your mics now. Thank you, Devandra. Thank you so Thank much. You, Beautiful. Thank Marat, you, Devandra. Gorgeous Marat, poetry. Marat. Thank you very much. This was Marat. lovely. Thank you, Devandra. Thank you, Marat. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. Yeah. Thank you, Devandra. Yes. Thank you, Marat. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's amazing to see so many people from so many places. Yes. Gracias. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Marat, languages. for reading on the show. Someone is a musician. I see an instrument in the background there. The keyboard. <laughs> um, oh, and that's... Uh, the video maybe oh that's yeah that's sophia ah, ah. hi <laughs> collaborator collaborator hi there <laughs> hey, what were you asking to me the the this one yeah you must be a magician uh, no 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 i'm <laughs> an, an uh, visual artist performance oh. i'm a personal i perform <laughs> There's a dog. There's always a dog. Thank you, you guys. Thank you, Connie. Devandra. Thanks, Connie. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Marat. Great pleasure. Thank you for a beautiful reading. Okay. Um, thank you all for coming to our end of Zoom concert. Uh, and please tune it back in on Monday at 1 p.m. when we're back with Joan Jonas and Daisy de Rossier for the new social environment. Um, cheers. Thanks, Malika. Thanks, Malika. Thanks, Thanks Connie. Thank, Thank you, everyone. everybody. Bye, Tom. Bye, Jason. Thank you, Connie. Go read that rail, Jason. Yeah, yeah. Bye, Marina. Hey, Jason. <laughs>